Mr. Ben Juice, and I'm a, a CESA project officer with the University of uh, Adelaide um, tonight. So it's my delight to introduce Karen Butler, who will take us on a deep dive into helping our kids become data detectives. Now, Karen is a curriculum manager at Technologies Art of Six for South Australia's Department of Education in South Australia. And Karen is currently working on developing South Australian curriculum documents, which are designed to support SA teachers to implement the technologies learning area. Uh, she'll be presenting classroom ideas, curriculum overviews, and also lots of Easter eggs. So uh, that'll be devil. Uh, so presenting devil in the detail. Now we'll using uh, Zoom. Uh, just be aware that we've got keep try and keep your your mute uh, of the microphone and video uh, and chat function. And if you want to have non-verbal and non-text reactions, you've got that option there as well. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land. Uh, down here at Middleton in South Australia, we have the Naranjiri people. Um, hopefully you're aware of the traditional custodians of the land at wherever you are in Australia. Uh, and what to acknowledge the tr traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water and community. And I pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. Tonight, a bit of a session overview. We talk about what your favourite data activities are, uh, about you, how we can visualise data, opening data sets, analysing data from little things up to big things, and also challenging bias in there. And this is part of a larger webinar series, which has been going on all year and will continue throughout the year and maybe beyond, uh, which is uh, from the CESA Computer Science Education Research Group. Uh, we really promote using the MOOCs that we provide. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Karen uh, and I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Karen. Cool. I don't want that shiny mirror in your eyes. Oh. Hi, I, I'm actually also representing EdTech SA today. That's our, our teacher association in South Australia. And on the screen at the moment is our president, Tina Patakis. Hello. Um, you don't, we're going to keep um, video and cameras off until interactive parts, if that's okay, because it saves your bandwidth and whatever. Okay, so um, I'm just going to run through um, this workshop is about two and a half hours long. So I'm, not, I'm just going to go skip through some bits and just show you the key bits that I think might interest you. And um, put any questions you have in the chat or um, indicate that you've, you've got questions. Just try and keep your video and your microphones off during the bits that aren't interactive. And, and, and when I ask you to bring them on, uh, it'll be for specific activities. Okay, so um, you can put your mics on because I want to ask you a question. What do you think this map means? What do you think the data is showing on that map? That'd be Indigenous nations. It is something to do with Indigenous people. Yes, Peter, I recognise your voice. Good, I do. <laughs> <clears throat> would it, yeah, would it be um, population numbers of, of certain tribes or certain um, peoples? It has something to do with um, numbers of Indigenous people, yeah. Oh, Without, yeah. like, sorry, go on. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe like, you know, uh, those who are living in, uh, like, poverty? Yeah, no, it could be. It could be any of those things. And without the, the detail, it doesn't give us much, does it? So I'm just going to um, swing to a link. I'm just going to show you a video that it, what I want you to do is have a look at the date in the corner here and then just watch the map, okay? I'm trying to, you, you would have seen, you will see the title, so I'll give it away a bit. 
But this is just an example of taking data and making it powerful and showing us how we can find patterns in data to identify wicked problems as well as small problems and figure out some solutions to them. So have you figured out what it what, what it is? Those dots that I was showing you before? Uh, uh, so, yeah, go on, someone. Uh, it says there on the YouTube video, Aboriginal Massacres uh, map. Yeah. So I'm just moving something away from your my screen so I can um, read it to you and I'll just go back. Yeah, so um, I meant to say before I started, if anyone's Aboriginal, I apologise. I should have um, mentioned that some of this may be um, triggering and, and emotional and I, I should have said that at the beginning. So, um, yeah, so the, the map shows um, the Aboriginal um, peoples and uh, people indigenous to the land um, the, the massacres that happened um, between the 1800s and the early 1910s. And um, the stories behind these killings are only reflected in secret correspondence communications held in whispers, and the numbers may be um, grossly underestimated. So they're taken from first person documentation, usually from colonial people who um, uh, documented these um, killings, and they were called dispersals or land clearings or expeditions and hunting parties, rather than talking about exactly what it was that they were doing. And so it's no accident that um, they've presented this as a white washed map with um, dots of blood on there. And it, it, it kind of shows you a really significant problem. So the Guardian reports that according to the centre's professor the centre that came up with this research, Professor Lyndall Ryan, the massacre of six undefended Aboriginal people from a half group of 20 is known as a fractal massacre, so-called because it leaves survivors vulnerable to further attack and far less able to hunt and care for their children or carry out cultural obligations to country. So those big spots that we could see before, they represent 400 people. So it's a kind of wanted to, to first of all, acknowledge that um, I'm speaking to you from Ghana land, so... Um, and acknowledge the traditional custodians of Ghana, Ghana land, but also talk about the way that understanding data helps us understand wicked problems and then um, gives us the understanding data science helps us to give us the disposition to solve those wicked problems. It's also really important in terms of STEM occupations and wanting to get kids into, and especially girls into STEM occupations because they're on the, they're, they're on the rise and they're where um, the work is. So we want to switch kids on to being data detectives. So I'm going to go through some activities that might do this. Just wanted to draw attention to this little girl, Nora Keegan, noticed that the dryers tend in toilets, public toilets tend to be closer to children's ears. So she set out on a study all by herself that was published in a medical journal in Canada. So it's just an example of how kids are switched on to this. They want to be engaged in this. They want to have a say in what's um, meaningful to them. So it's not hard to engage them when we give them real problems to solve. This is a, um, I'm going to skip this because this is what I would do if we were in a face-to-face. -face. I would get you to tell me what your superpower would be and then we'd look at the results. But I'll just go into it and show you because I don't know if many of you use Google Forms, but it's a really interesting and quick way to gather a lot of data. So I've, I gave um, some teachers this and said, you know, what would your superpower be? And I got 152 responses. Anyone want to have a quick guess at what they think their favourite one was? There, are, there's the options. What would your superpower be? Call it out. Oh, you could have to say time travel would be pretty cool. Right. Anyone else? Speak any language. Yeah. Oh, breathing underwater for me. <laughs> I speak underwater, but I just don't. I <laughs> Might be able to speak anywhere, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I think I think time travel for mine too. Yeah, All right. Um, you, I think. What do you think most teachers pick? These are all teachers that took this survey. Able to read minds. Able to read. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That'd be terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's what they picked the most. Yeah. Time travel. There you go. I'm not sure why that is. Do they want to go back and do a, a career change? <laughs> 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 or do they want to go 
go back and correct their mistakes or what is that? But the second most popular, um, able to read minds and healing powers. So um, Google Docs and Google Forms or Microsoft Forms, any of those uh, forms give you the, the chance to be able to collect data really quickly and it all goes automatically into a spreadsheet that you can then use and manipulate any way you want. So um, finding the data is not hard at all. So Karen, I might just pop in there and say that um, Karen's sharing this um, slide deck uh, with you. There's a, a bit.ly link at the front and the end of this. Um, and pretty much e everything on your screen's got little links to videos and little Easter eggs and things that she's hidden among it. Uh, so it's actually quite fun to explore that uh, later on after this is finished. Yeah, so I won't be able to go through all of it. So if you have a look when you finish, it's open to anyone to have a look at, make a copy, um, use with your staff or whatever. So yeah, so um, stuff hidden all the way through it. So why is a teacher's preferred super powered time travel might be a question that you would ask. And then their second preference, able to read minds, why would that be? And so what other data would we need to collect? And you know, what business opportunities would that provide? So. We can think of all different ways that we can collect data and it's not hard to collect the data. So I was just wondering if you do data collection activities with your, your kids and what might your favourite um, data activities be? Just put them in the chat. If you've got links to anything, that would be awesome too. So I, I'm writing, currently writing units about the digital technology subject and a main component of that or the underlying principles of that is teaching about com computational thinking. And data is in every step of the computational thinking, but there's two kind of two ways of addressing the data strands in the Australian curriculum. One is through the representation of data, and that's not what I'm talking about tonight. The representation, data representation is different. That's about the way systems use data to um, represent image, sound, and text. So your binary data, your hexagonal, data and those kinds of things. And if you want to do things like that, there's all sorts of things that you can do that are really interesting and fun to do with binary data. This one is from the CS Field Guide, just to show you an example of the way that all images can be represented as numbers. So this is an image and you can upload your own low resolution images into this. So the link is in the um, slide deck. And you, here's a a, a, a Chinese temple with dragons. And if I zoom right in, right to the pixels, you can see the red, gr green and blue variances in each of those pixels. And that's how we represent colors using numbers. And there, you can have a, a possibility of 256 colors, which is um, a nice kind of bit length. Okay, so back to the, what we're really talking about is collecting and analyzing and managing data, which is another substrand of the Australian curriculum, although I think they're calling them threads, not substrands, but I call them substrands. And what do we do with this data once we collect it? We, well, the main idea is to solve problems and we wanna create digital solutions to those problems. So one of the digital solutions that we create using data is um, AI. So I was just gonna show you a quick thing about what AI is and make sure you put questions in the chat and I'm happy to stop and answer anything as we go along. Machine learning is all about statistical models. You probably know about parametric models, like when you're calculating the mass of the moon and you have a formula. If you know the variables, you can calculate the answer by plugging them in and doing the math. Sometimes you don't have a formula, but you have a ton of data and you want to find patterns or make predictions. In this case, you'd use non-parametric machine learning models. I'm Lauren Shore, and I'm a scientist who's been at MathWorks for over 30 years. I'm going to walk you through the three types of machine learning, clustering, classification, and regression. First, we'll talk about clustering. Suppose I give you a stack of cards with pictures on them, and I ask you to sort the cards into groups. Different people group these cards in different ways. What's on these cards to cause that to happen? Well, they are pictures of dogs, cats, and birds. Some of you say, aha, I see three different groups here. Clearly dogs, cats, and birds. 
Some of you see four-legged animals versus two-legged animals, and you put the cards into two piles. And those of you who put them into one pile might say, they're all animals. Well, who's right? You all are because the instructions just said to put the cards into groups. This is clustering. Clustering helps you segment a collection of things into groups with distinct attributes. Now let's move on to classification. You have the same cards with each one labeled with three categories, either dog, cat, or bird. You need to determine the features that help distinguish between the different animals. You use these features to train a model, which will determine whether something gets labeled as a dog, a cat, or a bird. Now I give you a new image. What category does it belong to? Well, let's run it through the model to figure it out. This model is good at classifying only dogs, cats, and birds, but it clearly wasn't developed for anything else. It did the best it could with the horse. This is classification, and you use it for things like object detection in images, predictive maintenance, and spam detection. The third type of machine learning is regression, where instead of classifying into a finite number of outputs, we're trying to find an answer on a continuum, like the maximum running speed of an animal. To build a model that will predict speed, we do what we did before. Select features that may be relevant. For example, let's try the weight of an animal and how long its legs are. The model uses these features to estimate where the animal lands on that speed continuum. That's regression. Regression models are used in many applications like forecasting electricity usage or stock prices. So those are the three different kinds of machine learning. Machine learning is an incredibly complex topic and I've just skimmed the surface here. You may have heard of deep learning, which is a type of machine learning where you don't manually select the features. Instead, the features are learned as part of the model training process, but it costs you lots more data. For more practical information and so I won't show you every single video, but I wanted to show that one because it, um, it sort of shows how data science underpins um, AI and AI is a growing field in which our kids might um, find themselves looking for work in. And some of the things that I'm going to talk about today relate to how we manipulate and use data uh, in order to um, solve problems and AI is one of those solutions. So we're gonna have a little interaction here. So if you're happy, can you put your camera on? If you prefer not to, you can leave your camera off. But I just want you to, first of all, get a piece of paper if you've got one handy, divide it into two, and on one side, draw a pig, and on the other side, draw a dog. When you're ready, put your camera on and show us your the two pictures. Sorry, Karen, I'd be happy to try, but I, I can't uh, stop my video. Oh, okay. It's got that the host has turned it off, and I don't. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Where it fits. Can we? Oh. Yeah, I'll just fix that for him. Okay, so can you hop? If you can, just hold it up. This is there's mine. So what's what's the difference? When I first did this, there wasn't much difference between my pig and my dog. <laughs> you couldn't really tell the difference. But what distinguishes a pig from a dog? Do you think? What are the main characteristics that distinguish a pig? The snout. Yeah. Oh yes, I left that off. The wiggly tail. 
let's hail the the body weight the the, the lack of hair or, or coat yeah and then Painting tongue. yeah and the dog and so the this is just a way of if you get all the the kids or your staff to do this this is a way of talking about how we can find patterns in data so we can see that what distinguishes a pig from a dog we can also see these as universal symbols like all around the world I could go anywhere and they would probably recognize if it wasn't such a bad drawing that that's a pig and that's a dog. <laughs> because we have these universal symbols so it's probably the tail the ears and on here it's the nose and the squiggly tail so but that we can collect data about the patterns and then we can create solutions and Google's done just that with something called um quick draw has anyone used quick draw so here's quick draw and you might want to um, have a go at playing it with your kids. And it's a it's an AI machine that's learning all the time as we draw to it. So you go in, you draw a bucket. So I'm going to draw a bucket and see. I see square. Oh, I know. It's bucket. <laughs> and then we might draw. Some... I see nose. Oh, I know. It's <laughs> knee. Oh, okay. Eraser. I'm not sure. I see elbow. Oh, I know. It's eraser. You see, it's got good at this. <laughs> I see nose. Oh, I know. It's hammer. <laughs> I did not get that. Okay. I see diving board. Oh, I know. It's police car. I see circle. Or donut. Or cookie. Oh, I know. It's pizza. Okay, so, and then you can go into any one of those drawings and see that what, the way that they've been drawn. And you can see how quickly it identifies what I'm drawing because it's analysed thousands and thousands and thousands of drawings. Mm. And um, it's also got, uh, oh, where, where was I? If you go into here, you can have a look at the, um, the data sets and see what they've, they've drawn. So if I go down, scroll down to... P, I can probably find pig and you'll see, where is pig? There it is. And you'll see that thousands of people have been drawing pigs and it's probably that snout and the ears that it picks up really quickly. So, you know, that, that there's a lot of fun in data science in terms of finding patterns and then creating these clever solutions. But there's also like identifying patterns in the data that, that identifies kind of where we're at in terms of thinking about the things that are affecting us for this time and, and why we might collect data on a certain subject and being open to finding different sort of patterns in the data and digging deeper and seeing what else is in there. So here's a guy that is a data scientist and a journalist. So he's a data science journalist and he's, I'm just gonna show you a little bit of what he found by just digging deep into data. Landscape now. We need to imagine what a landscape of the world's fears might look like. Let's take a look. This is mountains out of molehills, a timeline of global media panic. So I'll label this for you in a second. But the height here, I want to point out, is the intensity of certain fears in, as reported in the media. Let me point them out. So this, swine flu, pink. Bird flu. SARS, brownish here. Remember that one? The millennium bug. COVID. <laughs> Terrible disaster. Uh, these little green peaks are asteroid collisions. <laughs> and in summer here, killer wasps. <laughs> so these are what our fears look like over time in the media. Um, but what I love, and I'm a journalist, and what I love is finding hidden patterns. I love being a data detective. And it's a very interesting an odd pattern hidden in this data that you can only see when you visualize it. Let me highlight it for you. See this line? This is a landscape for violent video games. As you can see, there's a kind of odd regular pattern in the data, twin peaks every year. If we look closer, we see those peaks occur at the same month every year. Why? Well, November, Christmas video games come out, and there may well be an upsurge in concern about their content. But April isn't a particularly uh, massive month for um, video games. Why April? Well, in April 1999 was the Columbine shooting. 
And since then, that fear has been remembered by the media and echoes through the group mind. Gradually through the year, you have retrospectives, anniversaries, court cases, even copycat shootings, all pushing that fear into the agenda. And there's another pattern here as well. Can you spot it? See that gap there? There's a gap, and it affects all the other stories. Why is there a gap there? You see where it starts? September 2001 when we had something very real to be scared about. So I've been working as a data journalist for about a year, and I keep hearing a phrase all the time, which is this, data is the new oil. Now, data is a kind of ubiquitous resource that we can shape to provide new innovations and new insights, and it's all around us, and it can be mined very easily. And it's not a particularly great metaphor in these times, especially if you live around the Gulf Mexico, but I would perhaps adapt this metaphor slightly and I would say the data is the new soil. Because for me it feels like a fertile creative medium. You know, over the years online we've laid down um, a huge amount of information and data and we irrigated it with networks and connectivity and it's been worked and tilled by unpaid workers and governments and all right I'm kind of milking the metaphor a little bit but it's, it's a really fertile medium. And it feels like visualizations, infographics, data visualizations, they feel like flowers blooming from this medium. But if you look at it directly, it's just a load of numbers and disconnected facts. But if you start working with it and playing with it in a certain way, interesting things can appear and, and different patterns can be revealed. That's what I wanted to talk about next is um, data visualizations. And I won't give, do the activity with you, but this is an activity that uh, is done in junior primary and you'll find it on the CSER MOOC. And it's, it's a, it's, um, data houses and the kids are given this black template and then they're giving this sort of um, key so who lives at home there's orange is you and then there's mum dad brothers sisters grandparents pets and so you can ask the question what's a family and then you get this diverse kind of response and you can see at a glance well you know this person has loads of pets and some people have no pets and I wonder why that is so visualizing the data starts bringing out the, uh, the questions and uh, looking for patterns and seeing if we can ask those questions to solve those problems. So finding the questions to ask probably isn't ever a problem when you um, use real um, problems and you use real data collection methods about things that are relevant to kids. So I did that with teachers as well and I asked them to do it about themselves in terms of, oh, sorry, I'm scrolling so fast. Uh, about how long they've been teaching and what patterns they can see. And you can see this guy says, we were one of the only schools with some form of BYOD program in place when we did it. And I thought, well, you know, why, why that school and why not others? So that, that was a question that we, that we came up with when we did that activity about our, ourselves as teachers. So it's a great one to do with kids. And then you ask the questions, what questions do you have? How can you classify and reclassify that data? What other data do we need? What can we infer from this? What business opportunities could there be from the, the kids' data? It could be like you could d d develop a dog walking service for people with pets or whatever. You can find all sorts of um, details in the data that are interesting to work with and create uh, problem solving opportunities. And so I wanted to use that cue to go into visualizing data because visualizing data is one of my favorite things to do. Um, I'm going to skip over this, but feel free to go in and have a look. But this is looks at um, how you classify data in order to um, in order to teach a machine to learn how to distinguish between images. But um, if I skip into infographics, infographics are a way of collecting the raw data, sorting it, arranging it, and presenting it visually. And when we do that, we can immediately see problems and questions emerging. And this here is a fantastic infographic of infographics. So go into that and have a look. All of those little pictures are links to infographics and infographics are not new, they've been around for a really long time. So here's an example of one. I don't know if you can see that very well, but that's a very old map of London. Um, but, oh, I don't even think I can zoom in on that. But you can see that these little marks here, has anyone seen this map before? Does anyone know what it, what it is? Anyone in the chat? Not Matt? sure. This is not sure, Karen. Okay. 
Well, you can see that there's these little these little marks here. Uh, every time that something was noticed, it was the mark was put there. And this is Broad Street here in London. And so this was um, the map that John Snow developed when cholera broke out in London in the 1800s. And so every time there was a case of cholera, he put a mark on the map of where that case was. And he noticed this cluster here. And what they did from that was they traced the um, the source of the epidemic to this one well, which would have been built next to a sewer. Why? We don't know. But um, using data visualizations helps us to identify the problems. And that problem was solved by um, closing down that well and making sure in the future wells weren't um, you know positioned next to possible polluters so it, it was 1855 that that was created so it was a, a really incredible um, example of how infographics are not new and our kids can engage with them in all sorts of different ways with maps and and all kinds of graphic tools that are available to them and we can move beyond the column graph and the bar graph and do some really interesting things with visualizing so Florence Nightingale is another example. This is a polar map here. So every time um, there was a wound, she would record it. it she, this, this is in the Crimean War. Every time there was a death from the wound, she would record it. But every time there was a death from a secondary infection, she would also record that. And you can see that's the blue there. And what she discovered was that more soldiers were dying from secondary infections than they were from actual wounds. And the reason was quite simple was that um, the, the medical staff were passing bacteria from one patient to the other. They weren't washing their hands. Very relevant for today. So she instituted washing your hands between patients and it drastically reduced the number of deaths by wounds in, in the war situations. So that's what I wanted to talk about, how we can, you know, use all sorts of different visualisations to figure out the patterns of, and, and the questions to ask. And one of those ways is, so having a look at those is, but if you do a human pie graph, so I've used, um, it's very blurry and hard to see, but I've used this human pie graph here. Um, so kids would say, you ask kids what their favorite um, screen participation thing was. We've got coding, I've made this up by the way, I haven't done it, I just, um, took this as an example, um, codings and this meant social chatting, making movies, gaming. And if you get them to stand in a circle right in, in the clusters of um, like-minded things that they choose, and then you just put a ribbon from the center out, you can actually physically create a, um, a pie graph. And then by doing that, you don't even need protractors and angles. You can actually get kids that engaging in this and thinking about pie graphs without having to get into that really technical stuff of using um, a protractor and trying to figure out the angles. And this is a polar map. So similar to Florence Nightingale, that instead of um, going in a circle, they've gone in lines, although I'm, I'm missing one now. So they've, they've gone in lines from the center radiating out and you can see what's more popular. So physically graphing, um, getting kids to actually physically enact a graph is a really great way of getting them to figure out why uh, visualizations are important. And these are a whole heap of Easter eggs you can go and investigate later. I think Ben got stuck in Dollar Street, which is about how much average people across the world earn and what their houses look like. Uh, it's got photos from inside their houses and what they do for a living and things like that. This internet in one second, it's a live data feed. Selfie City is what our selfies say about us and all the different countries, what kind of selfies they, they show. So have a look at that if you're um, interested. It, um, there's too much to go through, but you can go through and have a look at all the different things. And the open data sets are, the, are a really great way of engaging kids in public data and figuring out problems. And one of the apps I really love is um, Kodak. I don't know if you've seen Kodak before. Uh, if you've done the Joe Bowler MOOC on data science, you will, um, you will have seen this. I'm just, it's got data sets in there already that you can choose. So you might wanna look at the duck pond or the seals. I'm gonna pick roller coasters and open that. And it will immediately populate with a spreadsheet of um, open data, um, a dot map, and then you can have a look at your spreadsheet here and you can say, okay, I'm really interested in, I'm just gonna move, whoop, I'm just gonna move that over here and make it big again. Come on. Yeah, you can have a look over here and you say, okay, I'm really interested in the types of um, roller coasters. 
and then you can drag that over to here and put it down on the x-axis and it will immediately graph those dots for you. So most of them are wooden, I mean most of them are steel and some of them are still wooden. And you can also have a look at the two sets of data by pulling another one in. So let's have a look at what states they appear in. It's American data, but you can you can upload your own open data sets in there as well. So these are the states with wooden and these and how many wooden and how many steel they've got. So you can change those X and Y axis without having to have any kind of coding ability or anything. You can just see those visualizations immediately and you can use your own data sets on that app. So that's but there's open data sets um, all over the place and these link to different um, ways of using open data sets. So I would like you to think about um, the way that we engage kids with gra graphic representations of or presentations of information and the three questions that uh, Joe Bola suggests we ask is what do you notice, what do you wonder, so questions, and what do you think is going on in this graph. So I'm just going to show you a graph. I've included this in my unit that I'm working on and if you would like my unit of work and you want to try it out and tell me how it goes, I'm happy to give it to you. It's a year five unit of work and I'm happy for you to um, have a go at playing around with that in your classroom. Uh, so this, I've, I've based it entirely on the topic of screen time, but you could use any example of, of an investigation. I've just worked an example through of how you might uh, look at data sets and analyse them and sort of lead kids into finding asking questions and finding problems so if you look at this is a really good one because it shows how data can be misleading so um first i'm going to ask you a question what do you if you can turn on your mics and answer what do you notice first about these two graphs don't be shy um There's more use of screen time over a weekend than there is in a weekday. Well done. Yes. Bank is not here. What was that? Sorry. Missed that bit. Yeah. So if you look at the weekend one, there's more use on the weekends than there are in the weekdays. But it's actually quite a complex graph because there are three axes here. There's the y-axis, you know, percentage uh, that's more than two hours a day. Here's the age group. So the percentage of four to five year olds that, that use screens for more than two hours a day. And then on this side is the mean daily screen use here. So what you would think, just looking at that without reading those axes carefully, is, oh, the kids use less than the mean average, wouldn't you? Would you look at it and think that? Yeah. That's immediately what I thought when I looked at it. But when I looked at it deeply, I thought, actually, no, this is... Four, this is the percentage of four and five-year-olds who use more than two hours a day. And I would have thought four to five-year-olds would have been less than six and seven-year-olds. But it's as it is on the weekend. So maybe that's because they're at home. Who knows? And this is your mean average minute spent on screens. So it's a good way of saying you have to be really careful because sometimes the way that something's visualised can be misleading. This is um, any screen-based activity weekdays, watching television weekdays, computer games weekdays. So you can then, they're starting to differentiate between the screen time. And this is basically what I'm getting at in the, in the investigation is that there's these kind of limits that are placed on screen time as a whole, but it's not very useful because it doesn't differentiate the screen time so actually watching down passively watching YouTube uses less brain power than say playing a game where you have to apply logic and reason and try and trial and error. So I thought it would be good to investigate something that's relevant to the kids and get them questioning what do they think about this two hour limit, especially if uh, most kids are exceeding it. So I would get them to come up with three questions and a problem that they could solve and some possible solutions after looking at that and uh, Joe Bowler says a data talk every or because they're American they say a data talk but I would say a data talk to start a lesson every day um, a data science lesson is a really good way to go so um, what I, I'm just going to talk about um, mean mode and median um, because it's kind of important that we think about the way that we interpret the information we see so uh, one of the activities I would use is I would provide a whole heap of small eucalyptus leaves and ask the kids to measure 
and figure out how they might measure them. Will they measure them from here to here? Or how would they measure the curve? Or would they just measure them tip to, to um, stem? Just decide that, measure them, collect the information, write down the average length and predict the average length. But then introduce, so whoops, calculate the mean and then also calculate the median and have a look at the, the two bits of data. And at this stage, they'll be very similar and compare that to their prediction. But then introduce this outlier, this giant, I actually two leaves together <laughs> to make this, but I did it with people. But this, I introduced this outlier, this giant. What happens when we add something huge to our data set? What does it mean? So it will, it will alter the results of our mean, but it won't alter terribly the, the results of our median. So that's when we talk about regression to the mean can be misleading. So really helping students um, be critical about the data that they use and ask lots of questions about what's actually going on here. Because re regression to the mean can um, create us to a, a situation where we create, a, um, we, we say something causes something else or, so, you know, in real estate, it's better to know the median price than it is the mean of the average price because there are, you know, in any suburb, there's millionaires row and there's you know, flats in the units. And also, just as an aside, there's a, a app called iNaturalist if you wanted to know what the leaves actually were. But so that that's, brings me to correlation versus causation, and it's an important distinction because if you thought that one... Um, data set influenced another, you would think that eating ice cream could increase your chances of drowning. Why? Because ice cream um, consumption increases at the same time that drowning increases. Anyone want to have a guess why that might be? Uh, time down the beach? Yeah, oh. summer. Yeah, it's also summer. So people, more people at the beach, more people around water. Um, so, and there's, these all link to studies as well. So does sleep increase in longevity? Apparently not. The more sleep you get, the longer you live, is what a lot of us think, um, because the, there's correlations, but there's no causative link. So it's important to understand the di distinction. This is just a bit of a, um, a humorous thing. Will ma eating macas kill you? Probably, if you ate it every day. <laughs> but the, the interesting thing is that this has been visualised. So these are all the macas stores across the US. See that? All right. And these are all the cemeteries across the US. So you can see they are remarkably similar. <laughs> but one doesn't cause the other, is what I'm trying to say there. So um, understanding correlation and causation is really important. And then that's why I brought in the, the whole idea of outliers. You can, and it doesn't matter what problems we're solving, so long as they're relevant to the kids, they can be small, they can be wicked, so long as we're looking at problems. And we also employ, to solve those problems, we use design thinking. And there's a little uh, explanatory movie there on what design thinking is. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's really important is to think about challenging bias. So when we co collect data, we need to make sure it's representative. So in that... Um, screen unit I've got a little bit in there about you know who's using what screen time and, and what's considered valuable screen time and what isn't and you know girls tend to um, go more to social media and chatting and, and building relationships that way boys tend to sit with gaming but if you actually look carefully at the gaming things that they choose those gamings also have a social element to them where they're chatting to each other while they're gaming so, um, you know, challenging gender stereotypes is, is a really important thing. And there's a little video here by Jo Lamwini, I think I said that incorrectly. But she collected a whole heap of data about, data about um, the ways that, um, uh, well, I'll show you a little bit of it. It's really fascinating. I'm Joy, and I research how computers detect, recognize, and classify people's faces. In my TED featured talk, I spoke about my experience with the coded gaze, my term for algorithmic bias. 
The system I was using worked well on my lighter skinned friend's face, but when it came to detecting my face, it didn't do so well until I put on a white mask. After my talk was posted, I tested my speaker image profile across different facial analysis demos. Two of the demos didn't detect my face. So I'll let you watch the rest of that, but it, it's fascinating that um, uh, facial recognition and detection software is um, has been, you know, the industry is largely uh, made up of um, white male coders. And so um, women of colour and people of colour generally were not detected well in those, um, in those algorithms that were created based on uh, millions and millions and millions of data sets of faces. So obviously the, the, the data sets weren't representative. So that's another thing to, to discuss and bring out with your kids. And if you're interested in data, data sets and AI, um, I'll throw over to uh, Ben in a minute and you can um, join the CESA MOOC. I used to work with CESA as well and they've um, created these amazing MOOCs that you can join and um, find out all about um, AI and AR. And I won't show you this, but that's, that's the leader of the MOOC there and it talks all about what is AI, how it works and how it uses huge data sets to, to build these in, incredible programs. So if you'd like a unit, just email me here and I will email you the unit and the resources and you can have a go at trialing it out in your classroom. But I've really skimmed the surface of how you can um, grow data detectives in your sites. And rather than devil in the detail, I think there's actual beauty in the detail and the more, the, 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 the more we can get kids digging in and diving in and, and really questioning and being critical about the data and visualizing it in really creative ways, the more we can get them to de demonstrate that disposition to solving the world's wicked problems. So thank you. That was a zoom through. Well, well, a, thanks. There's a work, there's a work, the uh, slide deck if you would like it. Cool. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll give you time to uh, write that down. As you said. And that, as I was saying before, I really suggest you do take uh, a good look at that slide deck because I know Karen skipped over heaps of little hidden gems um, right through that that you can use tomorrow in your classroom. Uh, and I've since I've oh, I had the opportunity to have a look at this before Karen um, presented. And yeah, I've used the stuff, especially the the one about the money street. Dollar dollar street. Oh, he's looking. Um, which was cool. If it. Uh, Kids love the toilets. It's very good. Um, yeah, so as I said, we'll, we'll, and Karen did mention uh, about the MOOCs. Uh, if you haven't, oh, you need to have a look at the, the MOOCs that the range. Um, yeah, sorry, it's you right. You're just glitching a bit, John. Are you okay? Yep, sorry. I'm um, out, the, out in the country. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's, if you haven't had the opportunity to have a look at the, the University um, of Adelaide MOOCs, I fully recommend. It's great for people starting out or, or going right through. Uh, and certainly the latest ones about the cyber security uh, is really good for high school kids as well, uh, if that's your, that's your thing. Um, big thank you uh, for scooting through that, Karen. I really appreciate it. And I think uh, the other participants do as well. If you could uh, feel free to leave some feedback. We're always interested in improving our game. Uh, <laughs> and certainly the webinar series on YouTube. So am I still glitching? Yeah, every now and then. You're yeah. right, okay. That's my old uh, rap dancing times. <laughs>